Amen, amen. One of my favorite Christmas tunes is kind of new, and, and I hope you guys have enjoyed worshiping with us today. It's always fun if, if, um, if the worship band gets me like emotionally crying before I come up here so my nose is dripping as soon as I stand up. It's awesome. So here we go all the way through the sermon, all right? God bless you guys. Merry Christmas. It's Christmas week. So good to see you all. I see some of you are breaking out some of your Christmas attire. You look so great here. Online, we're glad that you're with us here today. Alex from Naples, Florida. I bet it's warmer there. Uh, The Beatty Bunch in Branson, Missouri, probably warmer there. Beckman family in Florida. Tony in Clinton, Illinois, same temperature. Glad you guys are all with us today. Thank you guys for joining us. And if you're visiting here today, we are glad that you're here because we want to share with you this Noel, this this great truth we found in Jesus Christ and his birth. It's changed the world. It's changed us. And we want to share with you. I got two questions uh, for you today if you're a, a, a part of the Eastview family. Number one, which service are you coming to for Christmas Eve? And number two, who are you inviting? Those are very, very important. I hope you're thinking about that. We've been praying for a long time. I've already invited the four people that I've been praying for since February every day, and uh, I've invited them. I hope they're gonna show up. I don't know what's gonna happen, but at least let's let let God figure that one out. Let's just make the invitation. Well, today I wanna show you something really cool as we come to our Christmas mystery and our time in the word from the prophet Isaiah. This is a miniature replica of uh, one of the jars from the Qumran Caves. If you don't know what Qumran is, Qumran is the place where in 1946 they discovered some ancient writings that part of them were the Old Testament scripture. This is actually here, the whole scroll, and and it's got the whole scroll and everything in it. So these were like, like these clay jars that were six feet tall, okay? And then this is a replica of the Isaiah scroll. This is how they read the Bible back in the days. This thing is four feet tall, and it's 26 feet long, the one that they found totally intact. And what's amazing about it is before this, the closest translation we had and the the closest copy we had was 1100 A.D. They found this in 1946, and this goes all the way back to about 125 B.C., and it's exactly the same. In other words, this was one of the most incredible historic discoveries in the history of discovering old old stuff, right? And uh, and, and the thing that's about this scroll that's really fascinating to me is it is the scroll that points to Isaiah. We read the Bible like this, Isaiah chapter 9, starting in verse 2, as we continue this Christmas story about Jesus born in a manger, but we look at the, the whole mystery of it. The prophet Isaiah described the coming of Jesus into the world as a great light. That's mysterious, especially when he said those words around 733 B.C. A great light is coming. Now, maybe you don't know this, but I want to go back to this scroll. These scrolls that they found in the Qumran uh, desert caves were written by some Jewish sect. Really not sure who they were. Some people think they're the Essenes. But they felt that Jerusalem had gotten too dark and too evil, they weren't following God's way appropriately, so they escaped to the caves of Qumran near the Dead Sea, and they said, let's have a community here where we'll do things the right way, and we'll be, they actually were referred to as the sons of light, and we'll have this community where we'll, we'll go deeper in our faith, and we'll follow the Jewish rules, and, and we'll translate all, we'll not translate, we'll copy all these ancient scriptures They were waiting for the coming Messiah. Now, here's what's really cool. I've been to the Holy Land like six or seven times, but the last time we were there, as I stood in Qumran and looked at these caves where they discovered all these scrolls, I made another discovery to this Christmas mystery. Our our tour guide, Gadi, who is a great friend of mine and uh, is knowledgeable uh, all things Jewish and Hebrew history, uh, somebody asked him about these caves and why, you know, know, about the, the translations and the copies. And he said, we don't know why, but apparently this community loved the book of Isaiah because there are more copies found in the Qumran caves of the book of Isaiah than any other book in the Old Testament. There are 11 different copies found, like this one, the one that's in the Museum of the Book in Israel, is completely intact, 26 feet long. I've seen it in the museum. And he said, Um, They they copied this book more than any other book in the Old Testament, but we don't know why. And I thought, I know why. I can tell you why right now. I'm not an archaeologist. I'm not a historian. 
But I know why they copied this book more than any other. It's because this book of Isaiah talks more about the coming of Jesus Christ than any other book in the Old Testament. And these guys were waiting for the coming of the Lord. They were in darkness going, you know, Jewish uh, history is gone. Jewish following is gone. Jerusalem's corrupt and dark. We're waiting for the Messiah. You know what they did? Let's copy the book that talks about the Messiah over and over and over again. So today we come to one of the most famous Christ passages from that scroll that was written originally by Isaiah 2,700 years ago, copied 2,100 years ago by these guys that lived in these caves. And we come to this mysterious words of the prophecy, not fully knowing how it would happen. Those Qumran uh, copyists sat down and said, wow, it's going to be cool when this happens. Guys, we're on the other side of the cool. We, we know what's happened. But let's read it again. Let's, let's look at this Christmas mystery together. Are you intrigued? I just got to share you all that stuff, man. It's amazing. Sorry, this is not a history lesson. If you're visiting, I'm not a history professor. But maybe I will be someday. Okay? Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them a light has shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden, the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult, and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government should be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, and Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with the righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us today. God, we believe, I confess, I believe in your Holy Spirit, that your Holy Spirit living in us and, and convicting us and changing us and speaking to us and comforting us wants to, wants to comfort us today. And I believe in the living word Jesus who's risen from the dead and alive today, and I believe that his message is still the truth we need in the world today. And I confess, I believe that your written word, the Bible, is active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and it's alive. So God, here we are. We are talking about a great light, and we live in a dark world. So would you shine a light on us today? Every heart, every soul, every mind, whoever's watching from far away or whoever's sitting in the front row, God, would you move to reveal yourself to us, this great light that's no longer a mystery. We have found it in Jesus Christ. So now, Lord, we ask you to, to guide us through this passage. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, this prophecy comes in the same time frame as the one that we looked at last week. Remember last week, Micah was prophesying around 700 BC. Isaiah is prophesying. In fact, we can probably locate this uh, part of the scripture exactly as 733 BC. I'll tell you why we can do that in just a moment. But like last week, when Isaiah first wrote this wor these words, we have seen a great light. Those dwelling in deep darkness, a light has shone. When he wrote those words, the people were like, what light? Where's it coming from? How are we going to know it's the light? And um, it was a mystery to them. So this week, the mystery is the picture of Jesus coming as a great light. And there's a reason that he painted this picture of light, because it was a great darkness. 733 B.C. for the people of God was a great darkness. And here's the first thing, if you're writing notes down, or you can just circle them uh, there online, or the ones that you have in your hands. Christmas comes in the context of darkness. If it wasn't dark, you don't need a light. But it was certainly dark in the time that Isaiah wrote these, um, this, this prophecy. In the days these prophecies were written, the northern kingdom of Israel had already been annexed and they were being assaulted. There had never been a righteous king in Samaria. You know the difference. Judah, southern kingdom, Israel, northern kingdom. The northern kingdom was always idolatrous, always walking far from God. And because of that, they were in darkness. All of their life was collapsing around them. 
And so it was a dark time, and it was getting darker. I want you to look even in verse 8, 22. We didn't read it, but it's just right up from where we read earlier. Uh, chapter 8, verse 22. They will look to the earth. These are the people searching for something. They're blaming God. They're mad at their king. They'll look to the earth, but behold, distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into thick darkness. Look at that verse 9, 1. But there will be no gloom for her who is in anguish. In the former time, brought into contempt the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali. These are really, really dark words, guys. Distress and darkness and gloom and anguish and thrust into thick darkness. They're walking in darkness. They're in deep darkness. Three words really quickly that really matter here. The word distress in verse 22, 822, means hard or severe. Their lives are hard. It's, it's a struggle just to get by. Maybe you can relate to that today. Their lives are filled with anguish, verse 22 and verse 1. This word anguish means to press or to squeeze. You know what darkness is? It feels like you're surrounded, like everything's just pushing in on you. So they have gloom or a distress and anguish. And then there's gloom in chapter 28, 8, 22 and verse 1 of chapter 9. This word is actually the word in Hebrew that's used for depression. This is a depressing time. It's, it's not lost on me that we live in a very depressing time where there's an upswing of depression and mental illness and anxiety and suicide in our culture. Not much has changed in 2,700 years. Life is pressing in. Life is hard. Life is filled with anguish, and it's severe, and it's depressing. Verse 1 is very important for helping us solve this Christmas mystery because it describes the historic reality of this darkness. Do you see these two tribes mentioned, Zebulun and Naphtali in chapter 9, verse 1? Let me show you on the map where this is. In, uh, in the land of Canaan that was divided by the 12 tribes, you see up here it's called the Sea of Chinnereth at this point, but it's, it's the Sea of Galilee. Here's Naphtali's territory, and here's Zebulun's territory. Now, what you may not know is that in 733 B.C., a guy by the name of Tiglath-Pileser, there's a Bible name you don't name your kids. It's a Bible name you'll never hear. Tiglath-Pileser, he was the Assyrian king, and he had moved down, and he had actually annexed all of this area. In other words, the people of Naphtali and Zebulun were in captivity. They were taxed. They were occupied. The, all the world was pressing in on them. Their evil enemies had control over them. Guys, I want you to hear this. This is very, very important. Christmas comes in the context of dark, deep darkness. In the time of Christ, 730 years after this was written, guess what? The people were still far from God, living in poverty and under Roman rule. These, these people were no longer under the tyranny of Tiglath-Pileser. They were under the tyranny of the Roman Empire. They were occupied. They were overtaxed. They were impoverished. They were not free. There was no peace. Man, how do we get to such a place of darkness? How especially did the Old Testament people of God get to a place where it's so dark and it's so filled with anguish and gloom and despair? Why? Well, in a word, it's sin. Just let me give you a truth here today about the darkness of our world. When people ignore or refuse God's way for their lives, darkness is always the result. It just is. The sins we have done, the sins that done to us, the sinful world, world in which we live is a recipe for deep darkness. And that means that some of us today are living in darkness. Maybe you're a follower of God, but you live as a result of the darkness of the sin. Maybe you're struggling with cancer. Maybe someone you know has passed away. Maybe you're estranged from your family. It's nothing you've done. It's just we live in this dark world because sin's all around us. People are mean-spirited, and we live in a sin-diseased world. Some of us today are living in darkness because uh, we have a recurring sin. It's a habit or it's a, an addiction that we can't get past, and it just keeps coming back and back and back, and you're wondering, when will I ever get out of this darkness? And some of us still today are living in darkness because we've never said yes to this great light, Jesus, who has been revealed to us. We've never accepted the forgiveness that only he can give. And so we know what we've done. We know the bad that we've done. We know that we're not perfect. And if you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, this great light, this light that has shone in the great darkness, I don't know where you've been and I don't know what you've done, but I can tell you where you're going to end up without Jesus. It's going to be deep, 
darkness. But here's where the Christmas mystery comes in and brings us good news of great joy, as the angels saying, that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David. And Isaiah says that birth of that little child in Bethlehem is this great light. If Christmas comes in the context of darkness, a great light has shown. Christmas is a light shining on those who walk in darkness. Amen? Is that good news today for you? If you're watching online, do you need some good news? In the darkness of your life, Jesus shines his light. It's science 101. I'm not a science scientist. I don't play one on TV. I didn't really pay attention when I was in high school. Be honest. But we know this by experience. You don't, need to need, you don't have to be a scientist to understand this. Light dispels darkness. Always. You can never get a much, like if we, could, if we could just get a little light in here and just keep piling in darkness by the truckloads. You, darkness could never overwhelm a light no matter how big it was. Light always dispels darkness. You know this. Tyler talked about this. Have you ever traveled somewhere at night? Maybe you've gotten somewhere late on a missions trip or you've had a late flight for a business trip or you're on vacation and you show up at your destination and it's dark. Yeah, there's street lights. There's other kinds of lights. You've got headlights. You can see kind of. But have you ever woken up the next morning and, you, and it's a whole revelation because the sun is up and you're going, oh, there's mountains. Oh, there's a street there. Oh, Oh, there's a river. And all of a sudden, you discover all these things because the darkness has been dispelled by the light of the sun. It's the same thing as Tyler uh, mentioned earlier. When you walk into a room that's dark, we do this by nature. We, we start flipping light switches. It's what happens. You, know, you would love it when, you, when the electricity goes out because there's been some storm, and you still walk around the house flipping on switches. Does anybody else do that? Because I'm so used to flipping the switch, and the light comes on, and now it's not dark. It dispels the darkness. Even if you're like me and every once in a while you get up before dawn and you're walking on the trail here in town, the, the simple light on your phone will dispel the darkness and can be seen for a mile away. Light always dispels darkness. And all creation is just a reflection of a deeper reality because it's not just science 101, it's theology 101. Jesus is this great light who comes in the deep darkness of our death and our sin, and he overpowers it. That's the, that's the Christmas story. Christmas is a light shining on those who walk in deep darkness. It was geographically true when Jesus walked here on the earth. I want to show you something cool again on the map. It's like God planned this or something. But when you come to Matthew chapter 4, and I've got that reference there for you in, in your um, notes, but Matthew says when Jesus began his ministry, his base of operations was in Capernaum. Remember, he did a ministry in Galilee for three years. Here's what Matthew says. He went and lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. That those living in Zebulun and Naphtali in verse 1 he is made glorious. Let me show you this again. Christmas is a light shining on those in darkness. Look at this. Look where Jesus did his ministry. This is not by chance. This is the territory of Naphtali and Zebulon. And here is Capernaum where Jesus did most of his work there on the north side of the Sea of Galilee. 700 years before Jesus was born, he said, hey, Zebulon and Naphtali, it looks dark but don't worry, a light's going to shine. And when Jesus began his ministry, the light of Jesus shone in this light, in this area specifically, where they had been in the darkness before. Jesus is a great light. This is yet another clue to the ancient Christmas mystery. He was born to be a light in a dark world. So here's the question, and this is going to, be, this is going to frame the rest of our time in the Word together. So what kind of light is it? And how does this light pierce into our darkness? And what difference can it make in our dark lives? If you're here today and you just honestly, either in your soul or in your spirit or in your heart or in your emotions or in your mind or your spiritual walk, you feel like you're in a dark place. Listen, I got some great news for you because there are four names given there in verse six. I think if I just read them over and over and over again, you would be inspired by them. This great light is He's going he's gonna to carry four names for us. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince 
of peace. So let's start here with this first name, Wonderful Counselor. The light of Jesus guides us through the darkness. The light of Jesus guides us. So what about a great, a great light? Well, the light of Jesus, he's the one that helps us get through the dark places in our life. The name Wonderful Counselor is about direction. Even in the Christmas story we tell every year from Matthew chapter two, what, what did the wise men follow? A star. Looks like this one on the box over here. They follow a star 500 miles from probably ancient Babylon to Jerusalem, and this star guides them through the darkness. They had some dark desert nights, but they just kept looking at the light. Jesus is like that. Jesus is the light that guides us through the darkness, and his name, Wonderful Counselor, means that. The word counselor here means to plan or give advice or to, to help someone uh, know which direction to go. It's used mostly in the context of war. So you get an army uh, general strategizing, going, how are we going to win this battle? Jesus is this counselor. He lights the way to victory. Here's what you need to know today. If you're in a dark place today, Jesus can get you through the darkness. If your marriage is dark, if your finances are dark, if your future is dark, if your past is dark, if you just feel darkness all around you, if you don't know what your dreams are, or your purpose are, is, or your, what your money is for, or you're here, why you're here, all of those things, Jesus knows where you're going. If you just follow him, he'll get you through the darkness. And I love this. He's not just any old counselor. He's a wonderful counselor. I know some Christian counselors. Some of them go to our church, and they're, they're good counselors. They're not wonderful counselors. No offense, guys. The word wonderful means miraculous. He can do miracles. I've gotten some really great advice from counselors and counsel from Christian friends, but they can't give me advice and tell me which way to go and do a miracle on top of it. He's the wonderful counselor. He says, go this way, and as you're going this way, I'll do miraculous stuff in your life to get you where I want you to go. The reason the people in, in Isaiah's day and in Jesus' day and in our day, walk in darkness, is that too often we're not being guided by the light of Jesus. We're trying to do it on our own. And we wonder why we're tripping and stumbling and falling and getting lost. We live in a culture that literally insists on making their own way through the darkness. And they're constantly tripped up and lost. I want to turn you on to a verse that's not new to you. It's the first verse that I memorized when I went to a Christian uh, kindergarten when I was a little kid. Psalm 119, 105. It talks about the Bible. It says, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Its words will I hide in my heart that I might not sin against God. The best thing I can tell you in the coming year and even beginning right now is get in the word of God. This will guide you through a lot of dark nights. This book will help you see the way. Without this great light that's shown, the living word of God guiding my way, I will always walk in darkness. But Jesus is this light that has shown, and he is the wonderful counselor. Because of that, I know that I can get through the darkness. But there's another name here for him, Mighty God. Mighty God says to me, the light of Jesus has power over darkness. It overpowers it. This great light of the Christmas story will be called the mighty God. Jesus in a manger is mighty God. The little baby in swaddling clothes is mighty God. The darkness of our situation may seem overwhelming, but the light of Jesus is greater and mightier than any darkness you're in right now. I believe this with all my heart, and I can prove it by prayers that have been answered and miracles that have been done with all the people that I know and love. Mighty God. The light of Jesus has power over whatever darkness. Guys, the desperation of the darkness experienced by the Old Testament people of God in 733 was hopeless. There's no way out. They're in captivity. And so we have these words we see there in verse 4. You can circle them or underline them like I have in my Bible. But they, they are in the darkness of oppression. They are shouldering pain. They're bearing burdens. You see those words there? But Isaiah foretold that a light would come and he would overcome the darkness of oppression and he would shoulder our pain and he would bear our burdens. Many people believe that this verse four is an allusion to him taking them out of the captivity of Egypt. 
and the Gideon army of 300 guys with pitchers and trumpets and torches overthrowing a large army of Midian. I'm not sure if that's what this story is alluding to or not, but what I do know is that mighty God, God in the flesh, has power over all darkness. This is the history of the earth, by the way. You know how the earth started, right? Genesis 1, 3. It, remember what the earth was like before God came on the scene? It was formless and void and darkness. Darkness hovered over the face of the deep. And then God said four words, let there be light. And there was explosive, powerful light. I always like to think of the explosion of light when God literally flipped the switch to all the lights of the universe. Every star and all the sun power and the moon and everything that you see in this night sky, he flips the switch and all of a sudden, an explosion of light and the darkness is gone. Now John the apostle, when he writes his gospel, he uses this analogy of the creation story. Remember John 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. Well, if you go down to verse four of John chapter one, it talks about Jesus again. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and darkness has not overcome it. This is the kingdom of the great light. It's a kingdom that can't be overthrown or overtaken. It can't be, you know, the sin and the death and the desperation of our lives cannot overwhelm the light of Jesus Christ. It's impossible. <laughs> any more than darkness can overwhelm the moon or the sun or any of the other lights that God created. The land of deep darkness is the injustice and the unrighteousness of sin. The land of deep darkness is death because of sin. The, the land of deep darkness is the oppression because of the sins we've committed or people have committed against us. We live in a dark world. We are burdened because of the sin of the world from Adam and Eve until now, but a light has shown. Guys, it's a dark world, but a light has shown, and not just any light, the light that can overcome sin and death in our lives. This is a powerful light that exposes everything and that night when Jesus was born in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago, a great light had shined on our darkness. And I realize I'm supposed to wait until Easter for this, but also by his death, burial, and resurrection, this baby did not stay a baby, a cute little cuddly baby in Bethlehem. He grew up to become a man who became the savior of the world. And by his death and his burial and his resurrection, he makes all these things in verse four true. Our yoke is gone, our burdens are gone. We have been delivered from our oppressors, sin and death. I could go on, but we have two more names. <laughs> Everlasting Father. You guys know that one? Handles Messiah. No? Okay. <laughs> the light of Jesus delivers us from darkness to the Father. This is amazing. Because so far we've said that his names can get us through the darkness, can overcome the darkness, but how can we repair a dark world with a light father, with a father who's pure and perfect in every way, and we are not perfect in any way? As with all things about the promised Christ, he's different in that his kingdom will never end. He is the everlasting father. Look what it says here. He will establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness. The end of verse uh, seven, from this time forth and forevermore. This kingdom's not going away. And this kingdom's not going away because it's established by the zeal of the Father. That's the last word we, the Father in heaven says, oh, those dark, wicked, sinful people, they're wandering around in darkness, they're dying in their sin, they're lost without me, there's no way they're gonna find their way. What am I gonna do? What is God the Father gonna do for us? I know, I'll send the light that will show them the way back to me. I will send my son Jesus to deliver them from darkness and back into relationship with the Father. We're gonna talk about this this week, and I, again, I, I pray you'll bring your friends and your non-Christian friends and your family. If they're stuck at your house for Christmas, bring them here, make them come. No dessert till they come. <laughs> Just kidding, give them dessert. But God with us. That's what we're talking about this weekend. 
But this is the idea that God in the flesh, Jesus, was the Father. He was the everlasting Father, but he just happened to take the form of a baby and grow up as a man. But he was God in the flesh. He said over and over again, I and the Father are one. God himself would come in the light of Jesus to deliver us from the darkness back to the Father. Now listen, we need a Father in the darkness we need someone bigger than us, someone who can protect us, someone who cares for us like fathers are designed to do. And I realize when I start talking about fathers that there are some here for whom the word father is a negative. I get it. Maybe you were abandoned by your father early on. Maybe you were abused by your father. Maybe you're estranged from your father. Maybe you never knew your father. But here's what I will, it, 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 it turns out that even good earthly fathers are not that great because they're imperfect. They make mistakes. I'm confessing right now. I've been a father for 34 years. But what if there was a father who cared for you because he made you? What if there's a father who protects you? What if a father nurtured you and grew you up in every way he could? What if there's a father who would gently correct you because he loves you? What if you had a father who has got your back no matter what? He won't leave you. He won't hurt you. He would do anything for you, including giving his own life because he treasures you. That's the missing piece in 733 AD. These people were far from God. Their darkness had removed the light of God from their lives. They... They were the people of God, but they had forgotten how to pray to God, how to live for God, how to be his people, how to be distinct from those around them. And they were living in the darkness. They had broken their relationship with God, their father, because of sin. They seemed very, very far from him. And so God says, wait a minute. What if I send a child? What if a child is born what if a son is giving? What if I give myself a great light who would be called the everlasting father? Guys, though we, we have done everything like the people, our Old Testament ancestors, we've done everything we can to get far from God through our sin and rejecting him and not listening to him and doing things our own way and saying, yeah, but not now. But God, there is a father who sends himself as a great light to allow us to be sons and daughters once again. John writes later in life in the first century, John the Apostle again in the first book, his first letter, 1 John 1, 5 through 7, this is the message we proclaim to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Well, what are we supposed to do? If he's light and we're dark, what are we supposed to do? He goes on at the end of verse 7 to say, If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanses us from all sin. Only a great light. It takes a powerful light. It takes an everlasting Father to come into my world and take the darkness of my sin and turn it into light. But by Jesus Christ, he has done it. And if you're here today and you live in the darkness of your sin, don't. Because there is a way, there is a light that has shown his name is Jesus, and he's delivered us from sin back to the Father. One last name, Prince of Peace. The light of Jesus brings peace, even in the darkness. He is the Prince of Peace. When Paul's writing to the church in Philippi, he writes this very confusing word. He's in jail, by the way. And he's, he's telling them on all the pain that he's going through and all the ways that he's being persecuted and pain that's coming in his way because he's a follower of Jesus Christ. And then he says these words in Philippians 4, 7. And sometimes when you read them as a Christian, you're like, yeah, that's you, Paul, not me. But he says, there is a peace of God that surpasses all understanding. Your life can be seemingly falling apart. Your life can seemingly be dark. Your life can seemingly be going nowhere. But if you were in, in Jesus Christ, there is a light in your heart that shines peace. It's inexplainable. I watch people all the time. I, because of prayer requests and because of all the stuff I know about, I don't know all of you, but I know a lot of your stories. I know which ones of you have been in the hospital, which of you have been through hard times. And I, I just know. And it just warms my heart when I stand out here. Sometimes if you see me staring at you, it's because I know what's going on in your life and I can't believe how peaceful you are. Because there's a peace that passes understanding. There's a peace that comes when we know the battle is ultimately over. That's what it says in verse 5. Every boot, every garment, 
of the, of the soldier burned as fuel for fire. There's only one reason you burn soldier boots and soldier uniforms, because the war's over. We're not going to need them again. Nobody's going to come and conquer. Nobody's going to come and take us back. We are done with this war through Jesus Christ. He's the Prince of Peace. He brings us peace because he has defeated our enemies of death and, and sin, and we will never be hurt by them again. Amen? Yeah. Let's give the Lord a hand for that. And what these Old Testament people of God looked for, guys, we have experienced when Jesus was born in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. The great light has come and brought us peace. I know sometimes the current battle feels hard and overwhelming, but I know my enemies of sin and death are done. And I know that Satan's done. And so I can have peace and even joy mentioned there in verse 3. I like to imagine 21 years, 2100 years ago, there was somebody in Qumran scribbling these verses in Hebrew. Probably was bigger than this. This is unable to see. Mighty God, Prince of Peace, Everlasting Father, Wonderful Counselor. And I imagine that guy sitting there going, I wonder when that's going to happen. I wonder how that's going to turn out. The mystery of Christmas is that it's no longer a mystery. It has happened. It has turned out. On us who live in a deep darkness, a great light has shone. Peace.